the only people for me are the mad ones. The world is filled with the boring and the barely conscious. The misery loves company. But we don't have to live this way. Jessica and I are here to talk to those the system rejects, to radicals and thought criminals. The ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but push the boundaries of acceptable discourse. Those who stare reality in the face and dare it to be different. History isn't made by the timid, and fun is not had by the perpetually afraid. We are the mad ones. So let's get to it. Welcome to the Mad Ones. I'm here. I thought it would be dark, really darkly funny to buy some grape Kool-Aid and sip that throughout the show. But honest to God, you couldn't get me to drink grape flavored anything, host Cam Harless. And with me, as always, is your holy crap. It's the first day of autumn. So grab your Dutch ovens and stock pots. It's soup season, hostess, Miss Jessica Green. Hello. Doing, and what is wrong with you? Oh, my God. And I, wasn't it? I, I always imagined that it was red Kool Aid. So, no, it's great. Great. Was it? it? Kool Aid, but we'll get to that. We will get to we that. We will get to that. Yeah. Um, but uh, before we get started, I did want to say thank you and point you to a couple of good products that you can get a discount on if you use our code. Uh, one being uh, Run Your Mouth Coffee, who make an excellent bourbon barrel aged coffee that you should try. And if you go to their website, rymcoffee.com, and use the promo code the Mad Ones, you get 10% off. And likewise, Ooh. if you if you like smoked dried meats, if you like beef mm -hmm. jerky, we also have something for that. There's a uh, a, a website which is righteousfelon.com. They make some really great beef jerky, all very star-studded in its packaging with people who've been thrown in prison before, um, righteous felons, as it were. Um, but if you go to their website, righteousfelon.com and use promo code mad ones, you also get 10%. So saying that off the top, also hit like hit subscribe. If you haven't already, it helps us out. Um, but beyond that, I think it's time to bring in our guest and start talking about why we're here. So joining us tonight is a deep history covering occult deconstructing fringe Christianity explainer and the philosopher in general of the odd cast, the odd man out. How you doing, man? <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if he hears us right now I don't know we can I, say things about him and see if he responds should we hello odd man should we talk about how we really love that time he fought Superman <laughs> yeah <laughs> I get that one <laughs> <laughs> I don't often get um, superhero humor, but I actually get that one. Hello. I, 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 I wonder how muted. I can get his get his uh, his attention right now. I guess I could type in a little private chat. Hey, dude. Yeah. You are on. You. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this isn't the worst technical failure we've had, to be honest. So. It's, it's not <laughs> last week was a, a good one uh but yeah. hey i don't i don't know i don't know if he can hear us so he'll, he'll figure it out but i guess topic, we should start let's just let's just tell the, the kids at home what the topic that we're going to have well we tonight we are going to go over the massacre that happened in jonestown Gia guyana how do you say it guyana or guyana guyana it's every and, uh, documentary that I watched today pronounced it Guyana. That's what I thought, but I, f I swear I've heard uh, people call it Guyana before. But it happened in on November 18th, 1978. Uh, it is where the common trope slash joke, don't drink the Kool-Aid, comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't know the basic story, I I'd like to kind of flesh out some of the earlier life of Jim Jones and how we got to that point. Um, but... If you you want to give us a brief summary, Jessica, and then hopefully yeah. by that time, Odd Man here will uh, hear try us and, and try and in. contact him. Um, I just wanted to point out that uh, Quest says that it's pronounced "gay Anna," so <laughs> we're gonna go with that pronunciation. Um, no, so okay, so the idea with Jim Jonestown uh, was it was this Christian pseudo Christian Pentecostal. 
a group of people that started out in uh, California. And they had this vision of sort of like a Marxist socialist community that involved all races, all sexes, all kinds of people. Their, their whole um, thing was that they were basically like social justice warriors back in the 60s. And they were going to start this new community of people that was just going to be better than what was going on here in the racist United States. And so because a lot of their members, it, it was a cult early on. People's Temple was never not a cult. It was led by this charismatic leader. His name was Jim Jones. And um, this guy was well known for abusing the members of his cult, the members of his group. They would sign over their paychecks to him. They would sign over their homes and basically give this man control over their entire lives. And that's how charismatic this man actually was. And when it started to come out that he was abusing these people and some of these allegations started coming out, him and his members, hundreds of them, something to the tune of a thousand people actually migrated down to Guyana and started in a very, very remote place in the middle of the jungle. I mean, they're, I'm talking about they're surrounded by hundreds of miles of nothing but rainforest. Clear cut some acres and started this community, the, the, the People's Temple Agricultural Community. And the whole idea was they were gonna have sort of a, a new Garden of Eden. They were gonna have a new paradise on earth. And eventually, there were members of the families of the people who were there who were like, hey, you know, these people basically kid kidnapped my family. They were appealing to the government. Please help us get our family members back. Some of them were ex-members of the People's Temple. So they had personal experience with Jim Jones. And they said, look, this guy is not a good guy. Please go and get him. Please go and get my family member. So um, there was a congressman. Um Leah Ryan, thank you. So uh, Ryan said, you know what? I'm going to go down there. I'm going to bring some of the family members with me, and we're going to go see what's going on in Jonestown and ask the people themselves whether they're happy there or not. I don't think that Ryan had the intent to blow everything up. I think he just wanted to go down there, and if there were people that wanted to leave, he wanted to give them the opportunity to leave. So Ryan several members of the press and um, the, some of the concerned family members, they go down to Guyana in November and they appear at the People's Temple and they walk around and they talk to people. Well, during this tour, several of the members of the People's Temple slipped notes to the members of the press and to the congressmen saying, we need to get out of here. Please help us get out of here. Well, at this point, you know, Jim Jones was, you know, he, according to his son, he always knew that he was a fraud. There was no point in this man's life where he was like necessarily a true believer in any of the things that he was telling these people. He was just a control freak. And so he saw this as the noose is tightening. They're going to figure out my game here. I'm going to lose control of these people. So he put on a show that he was going to allow the people who wanted to leave to leave. But when they got to the airport, a contingent of the armed guards of the People's Temple showed up at the airport and basically started blasting. And they killed the congressmen, they killed several members of the NBC press who were there, as well as some of the defectors who wanted to leave. And only a handful of people managed to escape death at that point by running, literally running wounded into the rainforest. And it's a miracle that some of them survived. So um, at this point, Jones knows that the full might of the US government is gonna come down on their heads. They've assassinated a congressman. There is no turning back now. So he convinces 900 members of his cult, 300 of which were children, to take a cyanide-laced uh, Kool-Aid basically. Some of the people resisted and there are injection marks in some of the members. So it's, it's Absolutely, suggested. Yeah. yeah. Some of them were actually forcibly injected with the cyanide. Not everyone took it. Um, yeah. but by the time the, uh, helicopter helicopter showed up on Sunday, November 19th, 908 people were laying on the ground dead. Again, 300 of them were children. So this is essentially the story. There were 87 people total, I think, that managed to survive. Some of them ran into the jungle. 
Some of them were members of the cult who were away getting supplies at the time. And then there was one elderly lady, a 76 year old woman who crawled beneath her bed and managed to stay there hidden the entire time. Her name was uh, Hecanth Thrasher. And she managed to survive just by having an instinct not to go out there and, and, and wedged herself beneath her bed and was able to survive by doing that. So there were some people who made it out, but most of the members of the People's Temple were induced to suicide or forcible poisoning. Yeah, so to one thing I want to say to start is calling this a mass suicide is a misnomer in a lot of ways. Because one, there were, I think the final count was 910 deaths due to the the mass suicide, the revolutionary suicide, as Jim Jones called it. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. 600 of those people chose to drink the, not Kool-Aid, but Flavor-Aid. So if you're ever around friends talking about Jim Jones, Almost you can insulting. be that guy. <laughs> you can be that guy who corrects them annoyingly. Um, actually, it was Flavor Aid. Um, but that that left, like like Jessica said, 300 children died in this, and 300 of the people who died that day in the quote unquote revolutionary suicide uh, mm -hmm. were either shot. There are people who were shot with guns, mm -hmm. and or forcibly injected so that they were forced to die. So uh, calling it a mass suicide is it's like if you were what, what's the name of the website that determines whether PolitiFact? It's like no, it's it's not pants on fire, but it's 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 not completely true either. So, so I would say yeah, we I mean, need to class it as mass murder more than anything else. And it's also there's something to be said for the fact that although people were induced to taking the poison, you could say that they committed suicide, but there were a lot of factors playing into these people's thinking at the time. For one, the pressure of community all around them and everyone telling them this is the right thing to do, this is the right thing to do, as well as the fact that Jones had kept these people for almost two years in a state of overworked, um, underslept, and malnourished. And so a lot of people who you know don't get enough protein, who are woken up every couple of days in the middle of the night for these hours long sermons that Jones would deliver to them. And then um, working their fingers to the bone to survive in a rainforest environment. These people were not in their right minds. They were probably right. highly dependent on, you know, basically everything that Jones was telling them and he kept them in a state of fear. Yeah, I think that that is part of what I want I think we should talk about tonight aside from mm -hmm. some CIA connections, by the way, hi, odd man. I know you can hear, hear us now. So if you want to say hi, hey, man. the people are waiting. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, sorry about that. I'm not familiar with this platform and it had like the play sign. And I'm like, am I supposed to hit play? So I couldn't see you guys. I hit play and you're there. I'm like, Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> My apologies. Yeah, I'm no old. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. I, I hope you heard my Superman joke. I did not. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know, you're welcome. Um, but <laughs> we, um, we were going to ask you yeah. what it was like to fight Superman. <laughs> <laughs> he gets it. I, I think that one of the important things to talk about, there are a couple of things. First, the government involvement. And I think that that's really what Odd Man wants to look into and is brought to the table. I would like to look at the young man of Jim Jones. And I know that Jessica wants to talk about the brainwashing and how that fits into the whole picture, which I want to talk about as well. Um, I have a little bit of um, experience in cult like environments. So. So but yeah. before <laughs> we do that, because I, I want to kind of start by talking about Jim Jones as a person, some of the highlights that I've learned, because I I read a wonderful book by Jeff Gwynn called The Road to Jonestown a couple of years ago. And I had it's in the it's in a link. There's a link in the description for that if you want to read it or listen to it, any of that. Um, but I, I looked into this deeply a couple years ago. So I put myself through a refresher and I was like, I, I need to remember these different things. So I want to start with who Jim Jones was and why on earth people thought he was worth following. But before we do that, I do want, uh, so odd man here, he runs a show called the Oddcast, And uh, so if, if you could just tell them what you're, show is about your specialties what you're interested in right now i feel like that'd be a great way to introduce people to you 
Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Been looking forward to this. So I talk a lot about the New World Order, secret societies. Sometimes I just go straight up and, and talk about how disgusted I am with the two party system. And uh, but here lately, I've been getting into cults. Uh, I just I did a two part series on the Temple of Set. I did a two part series on the Rosicrucian outfit, a Mork. Uh, just about to release one on. Uh, a church uh, called uh, the Church Universal and Triumphant, which was a call in the 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and uh, stuff like that. So, yeah, people check me out. Awesome. Yeah, um, definitely will. That's right up my alley. <laughs> and, and that's something that I had said. I don't know if I said it to you, Odd Man, but I'd said it to Jessica. I was like, I, I do like talking about these different cults. And so maybe in the future, we'll sprinkle in different cults that we can come and talk about the history of. And because Jim Jones left a cultural scar. And as you'll see, it was something that was used to justify Waco much mm. later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm. so yep. this is a very, this is a story that although, you know, it, hit 910 people and it was scary culturally the f the federal government knew how to use it later to do what they did at waco and so it, it's important to to note that um but i did want to start by talking about who jim jones is so that is, i i got a lot of that from uh jeff quinn's book um but jim jones was born um in the early let me look at the actual dates uh because I, I i didn't write down his birthday um but he was born uh, around when, um, who the heck, is, is this a rapper named Jim Jones? No, the... the, the oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Jones' birthday, Jonestown. Maybe maybe that, that'll that work out. Uh, so he was born in 1931. So right when World War II was beginning. He, his mother was named, uh, I believe near the end of her life she went by lynetta but her original name was L lunette or th she went through name changes because she was one of those women who was very fiercely independent in a time where female fierce independence wasn't super popular mm. per se um and so she was known for cursing a lot and wearing pants when she shouldn't and she had married a uh, world war one veteran who was much older than her she never she seemed to never love him as soon as he died uh she and jim left didn't go to the funeral uh one of the things that she really hated was the fact that she married him and had a kid with him and his parents uh jim jones's father's parents would pay for like their home and room and board but they made her work a job and she uh hated that and so in her mind, before she had the baby and when she had Jim, she said out loud that God had told her, I believe she said God had told her, I don't know if it was direct God, but she believed very firmly that she was going to have and raise a great man. And that was drilled into Jim as a child. But Jim Jones was, he lived in um, Lynn, Indiana, who grew up in Indiana, and it was a rural town. And, you know, in those places, uh, fitting in is very big. And that was right. not something that Jim Jones was ever actually able to do because he was weird as fuck. <laughs> like there's no other way to say it. Weird dude. So when other kids were playing out uh, on Sunday, playing uh, baseball or, or playing games, he actually got really interested in the Nazarene church because one of his neighbors went to the Nazarene church Instead of just joining the Nazarene church, he started church hopping on Sunday mornings. So he would go to five churches every morning, every Sunday morning. That's and a lot of when, church. He'd, <laughs> when he'd go to school, he would dress in his Sunday best and he would he would go in and people thought, wow, this is a really strange kid. Why isn't he wearing normal freaking clothing? Um, but the other things that kind of, especially as a child that stuck out for, from him were the fact that, you know, he very clearly wanted to be some form of minister. And so he would uh, take his kids, his kid friends, and he he was okay with the kids his age for a while, but eventually they were like, this kid's too weird. So I don't want to hang out with him anymore. 
because yeah. he started doing uh, funeral services for roadkill and other dead animals that he found. And he would have his friends do these funeral services with him. Wow. So he's very strange from the get go. Always needed. So he went to these different churches because he wanted to look like someone like the, the woman in the Nazarene church doted upon him when he did. He was looking for attention because his mother would not let him into the house during the day. She told him that if that he needed to go outside and play and, he, and she didn't want to see him. And so he was always at a love deficit his entire life. And so he was looking to fill that. So he did these weird things like doing funeral services for, for animals. One time he lured a dog with his friends to fall off of a, um, I don't know if it was a trap door or out of a window, mm. just to see what would happen if the dog hit the, hit the ground. So, I mean, the, yeah. the, kind of the, the pieces of serial killer were yeah. present very early on. <laughs> um, so I just kind of want to get this because there's a lot to this guy. Um, so, but we'll get into the, the, the other stuff, but, um, so you're, you're looking at a very messed up kid, a very messed yeah. up kid looking for love who wants to, who finds that love wherever he can and thrives on it. And so when he's, when him and his friends, and this was one of the things that made the other older kids not want to hang out with him. This was during world war two. So all of the kids were playing war games and every other kid that, he hung out with would play as though they were on the allied side. So they were American soldiers, but not right. Jim. Do you know what, Jim, what little Jimmy Jones was really into oh, no. <laughs> playing the Nazi? He loved Adolf Hitler. He didn't love Adolf Hitler because of his stances. He, he decided he wanted to do this in these games because he respected Hitler as an orator, as a public speaker. And you can huh. see how he used that same type of speaking and the way he <clears throat> did later on in this down this road to Jonestown. Right. Yeah. So. Wow. <laughs> so there, there, there's some information. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't want to I don't want to monologue too much. Um, but uh, one thing that people often get wrong and we kind of mentioned it er, uh, early on is that Jim Jones uh, was a Christian minister. Jim Jones was not a Christian minister. He started as a Christian minister in the Methodist church. And um, so as he was in the Methodist church, he, he did this and that, but in his private life, he became an atheist. And he was that annoying 14 year old atheist who's just read Richard Dawkins for the first time, who's calling him, uh, I don't believe in your sky God or your sky daddy, right? Uh, so he's that guy, but no one knows that at this point. So I noticed um, when I was listening to the death tape, he would refer to the supreme being and not, he would never, never say God. So although the people's temple was listed as a Pentecostal church, it, it he didn't seem to reference God at all in that yeah. way. He would say supreme being. Yeah. Well, and, and he was talking about himself. I, I, you, yeah. Because <laughs> this grows. <laughs> so he's in the Methodist church. He goes through that. Um, and so he eventually sets up his church in Indianapolis and he sets himself apart from other preachers and pastors because he preaches racial integration and equality between races. He marries a woman named Marceline uh, or Marceline, depending on, I've heard it said multiple different ways. Uh, but Marceline uh, was a, I believe she was a pastor's daughter and he was really his, her family was really well hooked up politically. And so he picked her for more reasons than love. In fact, I would say mm -hmm. he probably didn't love her. Um, and so he marries her a few months later. He starts talking about sky God and how he doesn't believe in God. How could God do this? But he's preaching God on Sundays. And so she wants to divorce him. And her mother, the, a good Christian woman, talks her out of divorcing him, which is the worst thing that her mother ever did because Marceline died next to Jim Jones in Guyana eventually. Right. Wow. So, wow. <laughs> so there's, there is, there is a lot. So as he started this church, as he was trying to build his flock, um, he did Methodists aren't known for healing. They're not known for Pentecostal stuff. They're not known for gifts of the spirit. They're 
a pretty mainline uh, denomination. Um, mm -hmm. And so Jim, uh, he eventually, uh, what, what he's doing at this point is a part of his job and the way he started as soon as he started the people's temple and shed the Methodist thing was he had to have a side job and his side job while he was building his church was he sold spider monkeys door to door and through uh, newspaper articles. One of his followers that ended up going with him to Guyana met him because she had went into the newspaper ad because her spider monkey had died and she wanted to replace him. And so he sold her the new spider monkey and pulled him into the people's temple. <laughs> I see. Yeah, what? There's, there's some funny pictures of him with monkeys. I'm telling you. Well, and that's another thing. Let me just mention Mr. Muggs because they, ha he had a chimpanzee in Guyana. And yeah. when, when it all went down, that chimpanzee died and yeah. he wasn't, they poisoned. poisoned it too. Oh no, they didn't poison him. They shot him in the back of the head execution style. So that means when they were setting up the plans for the revolutionary suicide, they had a plan to kill his monkey as well. Yeah. And this that is a like bizarre the... freaking story. I just need <laughs> you to, that's what I'm trying to. It's depending small. on, depending on how painful it was to die from the method of the Kool-Aid, the monkey might've actually gotten a better deal than the oh, parishioners no, got. So yeah. Uh, cyanide is a terrible way to die because it, it makes your body reject oxygen. So you mm -hmm. die a slow death of suffocation. And mm. so he would tell these people later on that this was not a, it was a slow, it was a peaceful death. And it's not, if you actually mm. look at Waco and the, 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 what they sprayed in and how the children died in Waco, it was a byproduct of cyanide. And so if you remember their bodies were bowed back because all of their muscles clenched. And so this wasn't that bad, but so it was what in the same vein. What I understood was that they also mixed it with tranquilizers and um, yes, it was a, it other painkillers and things like that. So they would pass out too. So it wasn't necessarily yeah, they just straight cyanide. Yeah. yeah, but they didn't pass out. And that will so one thing, that. one thing that I did notice when I was looking at uh, photographs from the scene was that people didn't appear to be doubled over as though they were in pain when they were dying. Cause you would normally see people like clenching their stomachs or doubled over in some way. These people looked a lot like um, they just kind of laid down and went to sleep. So I wasn't sure, you know, like I know yeah, that so cyanide is not. I think that they were laid out, but they were in pain. Hmm. And so even though they were laid out, they still felt every bit of it because they, they people talk about how they had to watch children die and you mm -hmm. could tell the children were in pain. So, mm -hmm. It was definitely the Mr. Muggs, the chimpanzee had a better go of it. Uh, but yeah, so I'm setting this groundwork because I feel like the groundwork's worth setting. Um, so in the, where I think we're entering the part of the, the, the story and the conversation where we need to go into why these people decided to follow Jim Jones and Jessica has history with a sort of internet cult. And I yeah. think uh, I, I like if, if you'd like to talk about that a little bit, I don't I, I I'd love to throw in some stuff here and there. And if if odd man has some stuff, but I, I, I do kind of want to lay this groundwork and then we can hit the uh, the harder points, the CIA points, the the government involvement points. Uh, but if you want to talk about that. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to kind of bring up is um, I, I noticed that when a lot of people talk about the Jim jo the Jonestown massacre or the pe the members of the People's Temple, there's a very sort of like victim blaming aspect that goes with it that says, oh well, why didn't these people just leave? You know, if if you know, why didn't they just um, if why would they kill their own children? And um, people don't really understand all of the various layers of psychological um, conditioning that went into driving otherwise probably very good decent people to doing something horrible and i think before people should judge them they should maybe try to put themselves in their shoes and understand what it's like to spend two years of hard knuckle survival out in the Gu guyanan rainforest where you are under the strict control of a leader who wakes you up in the middle of the night every other night to deliver these long winded sermons that come at three o'clock in the morning. And most of these sermons are concerned with 
the fact that, you know, there are concentration camps being built for black people in the United States and that the KKK is patrolling the borders. And any minute now, these people are going to fly helicopters in here and mow our children down. And you're living in this like really constant state of fear about the world. Not only that, they were um, not fed properly. Pro pro the protein in the diet was seriously lacking. A lot of the survivors reported that they ate rice three times a day. So you have over two years of um, hard knuckle survival in a really difficult environment. You're being told that you should live in a constant state of fear and um, you don't have adequate nutrition. So your brain is not necessarily working properly. And the only person you have to trust, the person that you depend on completely for your survival is telling you that if you don't feed your children this poison, worse things are going to happen to them. These helicopters are going to come in, guns blazing, and oh, they're going to torture these babies. And I don't know if anybody um, uh, who's listening also listened to the death tape, which is about a 45-minute long speech that Jim Jones gave as he was encouraging his people to take the cyanide Kool-Aid. But over and over and over again, he repeats to these people, they will kill your babies, they will torture your babies. Just the babies were really the focus of what he was saying. And so um, it, it, it's very, that death tape, that was very hard to listen to because you do hear the children crying. The children protested more than the adults did. The children seem to have their senses about them more than the adults did. Um, but there's also this aspect of community. These people had come there together. They built this thing together and everyone around them was telling them this is the right thing to do. And so I think you have to put all of these elements together and realize that any person put under these extremely stressful circumstances can actually be driven to do things that us sitting here in our homes, well fed, in our right minds, without any of these things to worry about, would find abhorrent. Um, so, you know, I just, I don't, I don't necessarily like to um, judge them um, as harshly as I think people are willing to do from very, very safe outside circumstances. Um, I, I have a little bit of involvement in a cult-like atmosphere. Um, not the same, nearly the same thing as Jonestown. I was inv involved in kind of an ideological cult. Um, in the 2010s, social justice um, started becoming a really popular thing, like an online thing, very popular. And um, it swam in the same waters as atheism. And so I kind of discovered both atheism and social justice right around the same time and got really involved in a very, very popular Facebook group um, that had something like 150,000 members. And I was an admin in that group. So I had something of a, a position in that group. And, um, you know, it, it's very intoxicating to have position within a big group. You, you feel like you're important. You feel like you're doing good work. There's all these kind of like emotional things that go along with it. And one of the marks of narcissistic cults is something called love bombing. When you come into these groups, you are generally a vulnerable person. That's why you're seeking out the group in the first place. And I won't get into all the reasons that I was a vulnerable person, but I was a vulnerable person. And these people bomb you with love. The love comes down on you like like a torrent of rain and I, they accept you, they love you and you start to tell them things about yourself. You tell them about your vulnerabilities, your traumas, all of the things that happened to you. And what will happen is later on when you start to question some of the behaviors of the ideological cult or the actual cult, they will use the things that you have told them about your life, especially your vulnerabilities and your traumas. And if you've told them you've done anything wrong in your life, um, they'll use that against you and they'll force you to comply by using the things that you told them. So you give them the ammunition that they will later use against you. Now, so what like happened with in Scientology, by the way, with the auditing yeah, process. Yeah, yes, which is, which is why I believe that to be a cult. Um, but so what happened with me is I'm involved in this like ultra leftist social justice, very much like the People's Temple. Social justice, we're going to make the world a better place. And oh, isn't Christianity evil? And look what it's done to the world. And, you know, I was very much a participant in this, this um army of people who would go out online and attack anyone. If you mentioned God around me, oh, it was your ass. 
and I was going to punish you for it. And um, later on, it was the summer of 2017, Rand Paul was attacked very violently by his neighbor and he put him in the hospital. This guy had to have surgery, he had a punctured lung. I mean, it was like terrible violence that this his neighbor had visited on him for being the wrong kind of political person. And I saw the people around me like cheering the violence. And it that was a trigger for me. I was like, wait a minute. You know, I thought we were the good people. I thought we were against violence. We shouldn't be cheering this on you guys. And so I started to push back because I thought I could. I thought I was in a high enough position within this group that I could make a difference by convincing people that political violence was wrong. And these people rolled on me faster than a lamb shakes its tail. Like I was done. I was out. And I got kicked out of my friend group that I had been involved with for nearly a decade. I, um, all of the people that I thought my, were my friends and that I had told all of these very secret, very personal things about me, now we're blasting them in this group of 150,000 people, or not thousand, I'm sorry. Um, it, how, many, how many was in there? Anyway, it was a ton of people. It, it, it was, yeah, it was 150,000 people, um, just about. It hadn't quite got there. That The group was called We Fucking Love Atheism, by the way. And I've been reluctant to say the name of the group um, because it used to cause me problems, but enough time has gone by. And the leader of that group has been outed as basically a pedophile. So fuck them. I'm going to go ahead and say the name of the group. So that group, um, they rolled on me. They kicked me out of the group. They blasted all of my personal stuff to the group. Um, which was substantial in its membership. And then I started getting all these weird online attacks. Um, somebody wrote my name on the digital bathroom wall. And every man in India messaged me <laughs> trying to get pictures of my bobs. So, um, yeah, that took maybe two years to subside. It was it was um, kind of traumatic, <laughs> to be honest. And I know it's like it's not nearly the same thing as Jonestown. It's not nearly the same as seeing anyone die or anything like that. But I am familiar with the narcissistic cult behavior. And really what it comes down to is vulnerable people who need someone to love them. And they draw you in with that need for love and they give it to you. That's the thing. You become addicted to it. You need that support. You need that love. And you're so afraid of having it ripped out from underneath you that you will comply with terrible things. And so I just think that that's something to keep in mind um, for people who might want to judge the people who, who lived in Jonestown that there's a lot about this that you don't understand or maybe haven't experienced and just um, try to try to have um, empathy for these people. Yeah. And I do, I, I feel bad because I feel like odd man has not spoken much at all yet. And I just kind of felt like we wanted to set the stage. I do want to um, get us to a certain point and then I want to open it up uh, a little more to what you, what you've brought to the table. Um, so the question is how for me was, how did they get almost 900 people to join this cult and there were there were multi-pronged approaches it was a socialist cult by the time it it hit um san francisco really that's all it it was for the most part they still had the veneer of christianity but it wasn't a christian church or a christian mission by any means uh so the way they got people in is they he shifted over to this pentecostal method and so he would stage fake healings mm -hmm. so one of the things that he did was there was one woman they, there's video of this woman they cut a cast off of her they say she had a broken leg the day before and then you see her walking around and dancing what J what you don't know when you see this video is that jim jones and his people had drugged her previous to this put the cast on her themselves she had never broken her leg she woke up dazed and confused in this place and they healed her in front of everyone <laughs> oh well, that's, that's he also be. He also had this fun thing about healing uh, cancer. So, you know, he would call people out by name, Marcelin or whoever would get the names of the people and what they were worried about. And he would do these fake healings, but he did one with cancer and he would look at someone and point to them and say, you have cancer. Um, and it was typically someone that was already part of his group. Um, but what he would do is he would point to them and say, you, you have cancer. I'm going to heal you. He would heal them and then send them off 
to the bathroom to relieve themselves of the cancer. And what would happen is uh, they had gotten chicken organs and chicken pieces, and they'd let them age and rot to a certain amount. And they would bring oh. that out with the person and show this stinky, fleshy mess and say, this is the cancer that was in them. And then Jim Jones would be like, no one get too close. No one touch it. The, it's an extremely contagious. It's taking all of my power right now <laughs> so that the person holding it doesn't get cancer. Contagious and so, cancer. <laughs> and so he, 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 he pulled them in with the, the promise of equality. He pulled them in with uh, not to everyone speaking about socialism at first, but the idea of taking care of each other, community service. Uh, they There was one woman who came in and had a lot of needs. And so she was brought in by them taking her in and fulfilling all of her needs. But what was happening in the background was anytime anyone joined the church, he would tell them, first off, you are with us till the end. And I need you to um, sign over the lease to your house or the, the sign over your house, your social security payments. He would primarily um, prey on the poor black mm -hmm. people or the elderly. And, you know, he'd send out those flyers that uh, I forget his name. Uh, Rob, was it Robert Tilton? The, the farting pastor. If you've ever seen that YouTube video, um, you know, some of the, the big evangelist uh, hucksters and grifters. And so he would bring all these people in. And so he, at first, they, like I said, they were in, in Indianapolis and there was a, a smaller congregation. And then he started talking about the impending nuclear war that was going to happen between the Soviet mm -hmm. Union and the U.S. And he sided with the Soviet Union. So at first he moved all of those people to Ukiah, uh, Indiana, to get away. And then eventually he moved everyone over uh, to um San Francisco, where they got a lot of affluent white people in and preyed upon their liberal guilt to bring them in to help people. Um, and then the final thing that I was going to say about kind of getting to this point before Guyana and before uh, what odd man, I believe is going to, we're going to talk about is the fact that, so he, she talked about love bombing or we talked about Scientology and their audits and how they get all this dirt on you. Jim Jones did the same thing, but he would make up dirt. So Grace Stone, one of his uh, followers, who he he did eventually have a what he called a fuck list that he would go through and have sex with different women that a heftier woman would actually take care of his schedule for him, who wanted to be on the list, but he wouldn't let her because she was too hefty for him. Um, I can't remember her name off the top of my head. Um, but she actually he actually had a child with... Grace Stowen, who was married to a man named Tim Stowen, who was a uh, district attorney, assistant DA, and she had a child with him and John Victor Stone. And uh, of course, Tim claimed him and uh, Jim Jones claimed him, uh, but they called him John John, but it was never known who the paternity was. But Grace yeah. Stowen was one of these where he made people who didn't he didn't have dirt on sign a piece of paper that said they did certain things. So like essentially an affidavit that would say that they had committed cold blooded murder. They plotted to kill the president of the United States or they'd molested their own children. So he Jeez. crafted dirt to hold over on these people that they signed so that they couldn't deny that they had confessed this. So at this point in the story, we are in San Francisco with Jim Jones. He's uh, ratcheting up, uh, work in the public sector. He's working with different uh, social justice uh, apparatuses, and he's trying to build power in the San Francisco area. Um, I think that that is probably a good place to st start talking about what you've brought on. Am I wrong? <laughs> no, no. And if I could capitalize on a few of the things you guys have said um, about uh, just, yeah, the way that he was able to kind of, uh, talk everyone into going along with a lot of the things that he wanted done. You know, it's like you said, he, he got a start on that. And some of those people had been in his church for quite a long time before mm -hmm. they moved to Guyana, you know, and he, he did stuff like started soup kitchens and he had these houses that uh, supposedly that some of the congregation, the poor congregation could live in. And the government was even giving him money, subsidizing these things at, at a certain point. 
And, um, you know, it's, I've, I've read that he was taking a lot of the money that was supposed to be spent on those people in the houses too, but which is probably true, but you know, he, he had done things and you had all these, you had local politicians there from, um, San Francisco, um, the, the Harvey Milk guy, he's kind of famous, uh, like an outspoken gay uh, representative there. He had ties to uh, even, uh, I think, President Carter. It was before he was president, yeah, but his Rosalind wife. Carter. Yeah, Rosalind Carter. And uh, he was in good with uh, the, the Black Panthers. He had been appointed to some kind of uh, human rights committee there locally in San Francisco by the mayor. So those people, you know, they, they kind of, there's a, a lot of background there, I think that kind of helps us understand why so many people did kind of trust him and grow to call him father. And, you know, supposedly when he would talk about black issues, he would say us, you know, us all the time. Like he was in that, yeah. you know, that community and he, he really was brilliant. You know, there's no way around it. Like the way he, he was a horrible, horrible person, but a, a very complicated, nuanced individual who knew how to control people's minds, a very shifty guy, you know, and I think when he, once he got into the amphetamines and started getting more paranoid, you know, you can hear in a lot of the tapes and in his sermons that he would start to get kind of crazy. And, you know, the craziness just kept getting worse and worse. At some point uh, there is a, like a, he was on stage and he throws down a Bible really hard. And he says, um, and then this is what I've read anyway. See, Lightning didn't strike me. There is no God. I am God. You are God, you know, and he mm -hmm. really was big into the, the socialism, communism part played such a huge role. And that was one of the things I was really surprised about that and him mm -hmm. actually not believing it, not being a Christian. I didn't know those two things because, yeah. you know, when we watch these mainstream shows, they never mention those things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I know I listened to one of his sermons where he's saying that socialism is God. So mm -hmm. it's like, wow, no wonder they don't mention this. Cause you know, it doesn't really fit what they want to talk about, but yeah. I do want to say yeah. uh, he did. He actually uh, laid down and said that the Bible was false and that he was God's true prophet before they moved to San Francisco. Wow. Okay. Uh, okay. So, th so that was in 1965. So that was before. And one other thing I wanted to say yeah. was, um, there were people, so he talked out of both sides of his mouth for a long time. Right. And even after, even after he said that there was no God and all of that, that was not his public face. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Jim Jones and what, what he did was he had his special group when he, he, he would talk about socialism and he would have the people come in for the socialism, not for the Christianity. And they're like, why are you still doing the services? And he would tell them and only them, this is just a means to get people on board. Mm -hmm. yes. this will all go yeah. away and so there was a demarcation between these ideas and it was always going to go away um and what was it? Well, the, just the fact that uh he spent so much time calling himself god or mm -hmm. I, I, there was a quote here that i saw um he where he he called he said uh the only the only god you need is you the only god you need is me and I was mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, how did these people do this? But the, he he separated them out. He made sure that there were the, the faithful socialists and he told them what they wanted to hear. And he had the Christians that he told what they wanted to hear. So there was that. Right. Demarcation. That, that's interesting because I watched like four hours worth of material on Jim Jones today. And not once was it mentioned that he wasn't Christian. Like it was kind of almost put up there. That like, yeah, of course, this guy is a charismatic Christian pastor. And that's, you know, mm. so that's, that's actually new information. I'm sorry, please go ahead. No, you're good. No, no I was just gonna say not since he was a child, not since he was a teenager. And so I mean, th that's, that's part of why it's kind of a, uh, in, not, not necessarily a red pill, it won't open your eyes to everything. But it's a small red pill in that the people who tell this story, try to pin it on Christians and Christianity rather than socialism, which was his real end. So you can go ahead, odd man. I for, there was another point no. I wanted to make. I'll remember it eventually. <laughs> no, no. And there's so much. I, I implore people to go and listen to the sermons on YouTube. There's tons and tons because they recorded so much that the people that uh, made it out of Guyana, they said that he would play and he had loudspeakers all over 
the whole entire place and he would play his sermons 24 hours a day. So yeah. if he wasn't he actually, actually said, he actually said, keep them tired, keep them poor and keep them hungry. That's how I keep them in line. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. And you know, there's so many uh, similarities with Jonestown and these other occult groups that I've looked into and they, they all have like these same kind of tenets of like, eventually they tell you that you are God. Eventually they, they, they convince the people that they, that the world outside wants to destroy them and kill them. You know, it's, it's all, a lot of the things are the same with each group. And it's kind of like the, the very important tenets that they drive home to these people to make them dependent on the group is, is all the same. It seems like, but, um, yeah, to touch on um, a, a few other things, uh, you know, that I think is suspicious at, at, at least is, you know, the, the, that area where they settled in Jonestown uh, a few years earlier, the CIA had been training rebels there. Mm. Yep. And then you have this guy, Dan Mitrione, who was from Indiana, knew Jim Jones. And before the whole uh, Guyana thing, Jim Jones traveled to Brazil and uh, supposedly he met uh, Castro. And at the same time, Mitrione, who had been in the military, but uh, was rumored to be working with the CIA, uh, was also in Brazil at that exact same time. So when Jones came back from Brazil, he came back with a lot of money and no one really knows. There's no way to really know now where he got all that money, but he got a bunch of money. And um, one thing about money that I wanted to mention yeah. um, was when he went to Brazil, he uh, told people that he um, supplemented his in income by being a gigolo. And that wow. one woman allegedly donated a staggering $5,000 for Jones sexual services, which would equate to about $36,000 today, or at least wow. to 2000. Eight. And so he so he had money and one of his explanations was and he said it in a really gross way, but that uh, this woman really wanted to have sex with him, paid him five thousand dollars. And and he he just rocked her world. Um, <laughs> one footnote that I, I want to yeah. put in here for people to look up to look up and to read the book on is um, Jim Jones before he met Father Divine. I don't know if you've heard of Father Divine. Uh, was a very man of the people type person. He didn't wear expensive clothing. He acted like everyone else. He didn't wear the sunglasses. Um, the sunglasses did were a mixture of meeting Father Divine as well as his amphetamine use because his eyes would get red and bloodshot because he was doing drugs. Mm -hmm. And so he covered that up with the sunglasses. But look into Father Divine. Look into uh, the fact that Father Divine, uh, one of the things, I, I, I didn't get a refresher on some of this but I want you to look into it if you're interested in this. Father Divine was an old black preacher and he and his wife, Mother D Mother Divine, were very rich and they had their own sort of cult going on. And one of the things that um, Jim Jones noticed that he did was that he had said when uh, Mother Divine had gotten cancer that Fa Father Divine said he was going to heal her of that cancer. So when she died... This was a surprise to everyone, but there happened to be this woman, uh, a 21 year old girl from Canada. I can't remember her name off the top of my head because there's so much information, so much to write down if I want to remember it. Uh, but he claimed that mother divine, her spirit jumped into this woman and that was the new mother divine. And it was the same woman in a white wow. 21 year old woman's body who he then <laughs> called sweet angel divine. And that's where he got a lot of his affluent um, stuff later. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Google <laughs> Father Divine, read this book. There are so many pieces to this puzzle. It's it's amazing. So uh, so he he was in. You, you don't know where he got the money. Uh, obviously, he was just ravaging them in for money. So we we know right. where he got it. <laughs> just a gigolo, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it was just kind of uh, interesting that the the Dan Mitrione connection there because he did know him and they were both uh, in Brazil at the same time. And Mitrione was known. Uh, he, he was kind of an expert in torture tactics and, and hmm. getting people to talk and, and knowing how to, to 
uh, kind of brainwash people and, and get them to do what he wanted them to do. So it's kind of, you know, interesting that Jim knew how to do that as well. Maybe not with the torture exactly, but you know, there was a lot of, um, I don't think we mentioned it, but like, you know, a few people came out and said like he would publicly, if somebody did something in the congregation that he didn't like, and this was before Guiana, he would, uh, whip them in public or have mm -hmm. other members of the congregation whip them like really badly with, with uh, belts and things like that or the boxing matches. There we go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he would make the, make the people box each other until somebody was knocked out. Uh, and I think there were wrestling. He would make, especially the children. I read that he would uh, make the children that were bad or that he deemed bad wrestle violently until one was heard and things like that. And he would laugh like a maniac. There's, there's audio of him laughing because when he did the boxing matches, these were not matches that were set up in like, there, there, it wasn't like welterweight versus welterweight. It was people were outmatched in these boxing matches in these public beatings and all of this. And so he had a, a very physical discipline going on. And that was part of the reason, especially when Grace Stone left the group before they went to Guyana. Um, I'm pretty sure she went. Yeah. Before they went to Guyana, um, that's why he started getting worried and started the move to Guyana was because he was worried that the local police and people would hear about it. And he wanted to be in a place he could not be, he could not get in trouble for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I had read that was his main uh, motive for moving to Guyana because he thought, yeah, he was about to get in some deep trouble. Uh, and, and there's another, if we forward all the way to the last day when everyone was murdered uh there was another guy there who is on video with uh, congressman ryan um Dawer, richard Dawer, i believe is his name d-w-e-r and he was supposed to be a member of the consulate there uh, in, in guiana and he was just escorting the uh, congressman but it was later found out that this guy was cia and he was one of the few people out on the tarmac that did not get killed. And you can see him in the video kind of right before the guns, you, they, they, you know, cause they don't get the video of the people actually being shot, but I think they're videotaping right up until that point. And then you see this dollar guy kind of move off to the left and like, like he knows something's going on. And, uh, and there was a, I know that there was a, I think it was another Congressman who, had tried to get this investigated. He'd found some other ties to the U S intelligence agencies, but, uh, it, it stalled and, and nothing much ever came of it. And I think he passed mm -hmm. away before, uh, you know, things got really, before he had a chance to really push it really hard. But, uh, you know, it does seem like that it, it has all the elements of a mind control, um, experiment and, and even if it wasn't that it certainly had all the you know, everything was there and it was the perfect recipe to control people and uh you can bet that no matter what certain agencies and in places like the esalen institute and the tavistock institute were watching jonestown closely and trying to figure out how they could use some of these tactics to control large amounts of people right yeah. Well, and, and I will mention, um, even before they left for Guyana, he started priming these people to kill themselves or to die by poison. Uh, in one instance, and you know, in Guyana, they called them white knight drills. And so mm -hmm. um, they would actually, he would, tell, he would tell these people, you're taking poison right now. They're coming for us. They're going to kill us. Take, take the cyanide and go. And it wouldn't be cyanide. But he even did this, like I said, in San Francisco, and he gave a bunch of people, this is the first time he gave a bunch of people a cup of wine, and he dr they drank it. And he said, uh, you, you just took a poison, you'll be dead in about an hour. And he's in people who were there, uh, I think, I forget the name of the guy, because there's so many names. There were th almost a thousand people that died. Um, but one of the guys said that they all sat there, and no one fought, no one punched him. No one acted like he was crazy for giving them poison. They all just sat there and waited to die. So they were primed for this. And, you know, 45 minutes in, 
And he goes, oh, there wasn't actually any poison in that. He, oh, I totally forgot. Here, little, little side note. Uh, when he was in San Francisco, he started doing fake um, assassination attempts against himself. So one wow. time, <laughs> one time he, he walked out his front door, took his gun, shot it into the door, and then ran inside. That was the first one says, oh, someone's trying to kill me. Another time he walked out and got shot. Um, and then when he came back, he came back in and one of his people held up his shirt that had blood on it and holes through it. And then he came in and he had no holes and he told, told everyone that he got shot, but he had healed himself. Well, Whoa, isn't that's... that convenient? <laughs> like this is a, this is such a, I, we're an hour in and it's like, there's so much about this. Mm -hmm. So I want to, um, I want to explore this um, intelligence agency connection a little bit more. Okay. So the, uh, of course, the idea that he was down there and that he had met with Castro and, you know, like they were definitely, they were openly socialist, openly communist, considered themselves. So during the death tape, you can, as people were dying, you can hear him saying, this is not how communists die. Communists die with dignity. Um, so it, in, I guess I want to explore because the, U.S. government definitely wouldn't have been wanting to support a communist organization. So what would maybe like the motivation and the connection be there? Can you like maybe um, connect the well, dots for me? Well, you know, it's rumored that it was like a, an experiment on seeing what they could get away with and how they could control you know, a fairly large amount of people. And you reminded me of something also in the death tapes, uh, either I think it's four or five times, uh, Jim, he says, get Dawer out of here. Da they're going to kill him. Get Dawer out of here. And that's mm -hmm. the guy they thought yes. was the CIA. So for some reason, that's the only guy that he wanted to protect and get mm -hmm. out of there, which is very odd. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions, but that's the only thing that makes sense to me is they would – possibly want to see how they could control people. And that was around the time of, uh, it wasn't too long after Cointel Pro and, you know, the, the death of Malcolm X and the death of MLK. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know I listened to um, one of his sermons the other night and he's basically putting down MLK because he was peaceful. And he, he's saying, you know, that uh, he's got guns, he's got this, he's got that, you know, he, he's, bragging about his being violent and he's ready to go and right. fight for whatever. Although, you know, he didn't really, be, I mean, it was just bizarre, but um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of strange things that are unanswered. You know, it could have, it could have been a thing where he was under their control. He was like an asset of some sort mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. trying to infiltrate the, the black community and get their trust. Um, sounds sort of like something they were trying to do back, back in the day. And maybe he got out of hand. You know, some of these assets just kind of get out of hand and stop doing what they want him to do. And he's all amphetamined up. And maybe he just got a little too much out of control. And they had to kind of let him uh, Cam, take himself out. <laughs> Cam sent me the, the death tape um, audio yeah. earlier. And I was listening to it. And I asked him, I was like, did Jim Jones have a speech impediment? which is not something I was aware of before because I'd heard him um, in other recordings talking and he didn't seem to have this uh, lisp that he had during the death tape, but it was very prominent during the death tape. And later on, as I continued to watch other documentaries, especially the ones where his son was talking about him, he said that his father was so whacked out on drugs, amphetamines, those kinds of things, that he probably only had a couple of months to live anyway, because his drug addiction had come to that point. And so taking that into account, when you're listening to this death tape, you can definitely hear that he's on something. He's barely able to like put his speech together. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I think that there is something to be said uh, as far as like the control of large groups of people goes by using a constant state of fear. And Cam mentioned they would have these white night drills where in the middle of the night, he would blast this air horn siren over the community, waking people up out of a sleep. I mean, I, I my alarm clock makes my heart, you know, jump out of my chest. So I can't imagine hearing an air raid siren and then somebody telling you emergency, emergency. And this is happening like 
a couple of nights every single week that he's calling people down for an emergency in the middle of their sleep to wake up. And then he would go on these long winded sermons. So that's, you know, something I don't know how many drug addicts you guys know, but long winded sermons at three o'clock in the morning is kind of part and parcel of the deal. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I One can definitely, I, I, I just want to say, I could definitely see where they would be interested in the level of control that could be exerted through, um, the fear mechanism, which yeah. definitely did work that, that put people into a state of everything in an emergency all the time. I have to be ready to go at any second and you mm -hmm. can't live like that. Like that's not mm -hmm. a normal state of affairs for the human brain. Not Go to ahead, mention Ken. there were there were other um, propaganda tests that they could learn from. So he talked about integration a lot, and he talked about um, equality a lot. And one of the things that he did, and his children say this, uh, especially uh, Jim Jones Jr. and the, uh, and Stefan, uh, but they talk about their rainbow family. Jim Jones and Marceline Jones were. I believe the first people in San Francisco, at least, uh, or maybe it, it may have been earlier, but they were the first ones to adopt a black child who became Jim Jones Jr. Um, they had what they called a rainbow family, only one biological child of their own, which was Stefan. And then he, they had a child who was uh, part Native American. They had three Korean American children they adopted. Um, and part of the reason he adopted the Korean American people was because he was allegedly very um, out, outspoken of uh, opposition to Kim Il-sung in North Korea. Mm. And so he put together this rainbow family as a means to show that he truly believed in, in integration and to show that he was one of them. And it was us, not us and them. And it was a very, in his, like I said, his kids say, you know, nothing ever felt normal. Nothing like they love their mother, but they're like, it never felt like we were there essentially because he truly loved us. It was about, um, putting out an image. And even mm -hmm. at the end when John Victor, his, whether or not it was his son or not with Grace Stone, uh, someone, uh, what's her name? Christine in the death tape who talked about, you know, don't, um, don't you want to save John, John? And he goes, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to save John, John. All of you are my children. All of these children are mine. Not one of them is more important yeah, than any of I my wanted, other children. I wanted to talk about Christine Miller because I think that she's one of the most interesting figures in this whole scenario. And there's a lot of um, darkness here. And like, um, I was kind of jokingly when we when we first um, met up on the the, the streaming, I said, um, "Boy, I just watched all this Jim Jones stuff, and I'm like so depressed. I want to throw myself off of the building." And I think one of the um, lights of hope in this whole thing was Christine Miller, who was this woman who, despite being a member of Jonestown, actually pushed back. And you can hear her in the death tapes arguing with him telling him this isn't right. These children deserve to live. We have other options. As long as we're alive, we have options. And he sort of uses this like leapfrogging ideology to like, you know, mess her up as well as the control of the group to shout her down. So even though she's making sense and, and she seems to be like one of the only sane people in the room, um, he's using the power of the group to shut her down. So despite being in a room with hundreds of people that are screaming at her and accusing her and this very powerful charismatic leader that's kind of, you know, making a fool of her, so to speak, she she did have the bravery to stand up to him for over 30 minutes. She was trying to make sense and bring people to their senses. And I think Christine Miller sort of deserves to be looked at um, as kind of a hero in the circumstance. She wasn't successful. She was probably one of the people who got poisoned against her will. But despite all of these things, she, she stood up and said the right thing. And I have some idea of what that's like to do in a very large group. And it's not a lot of fun and it's not very easy. So just, you know, I wanted to give her my respect. I think that she deserves and, that. And she had a lot of 
banger things to say during that tape. Like mm -hmm. it was um, for one thing, she was, she was standing up for the children that were going to die. Yeah. She was like, she kind of conceded in some ways about adults killing themselves, but she was like the children. Uh, we want them to live. And I think yeah. maybe my favorite, what, not my favorite quote, but there's this moment when she's sticking up for herself and for the others. And um, Jim Jones looks at her and says, I'm going to tell you, Christine, without me, life has no meaning. Yeah. I and, know. I heard and, that part too. That was shocking. And there, and I think that maybe my favorite thing that she said though, uh, because you know, he was, his point was they're going to come in, they're going to destroy us. They're going to uh, hurt us, torture the children, whatever. And she made this point, And I think that you said Miller, Christine Miller should Christine be Miller. thought of very highly she she said to him uh when we destroy ourselves we are defeated mm -hmm. and it was just like there's this person that's standing up to someone she called father person who who starved her at certain points who took all of her money and uh like one of the things uh so rosalind carter let me back up just a bit one of the reasons he got in with rosalind carter was she was supposed to have a um an in-person meeting and things were light. So someone called Jim Jones up and said, Hey, we need to pack out Rosalind Carter's uh, event. Can you bring some people? So they had like a fleet of Greyhound buses and they brought people in. And uh, that is what, where that connection came from because it made the Carters look far more influential and far better than if they didn't have Jim Jones. So if you think about it, Jimmy Carter mm -hmm. winning the presidency, Jim Jones had something to do with that. That was a favor that was owed eventually. You know, yeah. I'm really surprised to hear about all these um, high ranking and well thought of people that had connections to Jim Jones, who pretty artfully um, disentangled themselves from him when all of this stuff went down, because this was a huge story. All of us grew up hearing there was a probably a show about Jim Jones and Jonestown every week when I was growing up. So it was something that a lot of people knew about. And you heard a lot about, but you never hear about the Carters being connected to Jim Jones. And that's a pretty damning piece of knowledge, I think. Yeah. Well, in, in, in his, his bid for integration, he would go into the, he would bring his black followers into restaurants that were essentially segregated and he would pay for all of their meals. And so people would be like, wow, what a great thing to do. It right. was their money. It was their money. <laughs> It was their pensions. Yeah. It was it was their social security. It was their savings, and he, he used them to gain power and influence where he was. So I just yeah. wanted to throw that little tidbit in there. You know, uh, I didn't realize it till yesterday. Yesterday, and I was reading that he got that whole term uh, was it revolutionary, revolutionary suicide, suicide from uh, the Black Panther Huey Newton's book. He had a book about the black liberation theology or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where he got that term. So I um, thought that was interesting. You know, during one thing that sparked my interest during the death tapes is he's talking to these people and he's talking to them about killing themselves. And he points out all of the people that have walked out of the, I guess it's the pavilion, not the room. They're in an outdoor pavilion. He says, you notice all the people that walked out of here, they're the white people. And you hear the congregation sort of assenting, yeah, yeah. And um, a woman then speaks into the mic and she says, I hate to think about all these people who've lived with us all these, this time, these white people, but they're not really with us, are they? And you do hear Jim Jones refer to himself with that congregation as us. They don't know about our struggle. They're not with us. And so there is this kind of, um, he's identifying himself with specifically the, the black members. And there's even in this sort of like ending moment, he's pitting this sort of like uh, racial divide that he claims to be against, but he's using it as a way to influence the people, perhaps the white people who have not walked out of the pavilion to go, oh, no, I'm not with those bad white people who want to survive. I'm with us. I'm with the group here that's going to die. And so you can see that way that he's using really 
kind of brilliantly in a way using the psychology of this us versus them to get the people who are still not sure to assent to what's going on because they don't want to be thought of as racist or they don't want to mm -hmm. be thought of as you know the bad kind of white people so yeah. they bring their children up to the front and feed them cyanide because they don't want to be called racist and you see this sort of ideology in our culture today where people who are probably good decent people are assenting to horrible horrible things because they don't want to be seen as the bad kind of people mm -hmm. And it's, you know, a lot of this is playing out at large in our culture today. Things that happened in a microcosm in Guyana at the hands of one crazy guy now are being, you know, used widely in our culture. And I think that that's maybe something to know. I, when I heard him say that, my jaw dropped because I'm like, that's the same, I, that's the same rhetoric that they use now to say, well, you, yeah. you're not the bad kind of white person, are you? You're one of us, right? I'm glad that you mentioned that because I, I couldn't help but think the same thing. It's kind of like you, exactly like you said. It's a microcosm of what is going on politically now, and and has been going on for quite a while. And you know, it's it's a lot of the same tactics of control that are used in a in a cult, or the same ones that are used in politics. You know, we just don't think of it that way because we're so mm -hmm. used to the politics and the tribalism and the party rival or rivalry and stuff like that. But it's really the same stuff. Uh, you know, I, I read one thing, you know, um, Cam had mentioned uh, Jim Jones's sex list, like the, the girls that he wanted to have sex with. But uh, I don't know if this was true or not, but it said that he told the men that he was oh, the only straight men, only straight man left. And they were all closet homosexuals. And basically, that's how he proceeded to kind of say, you know, if you need sex, women, I am here for you. And basically was telling them that he's the only one they're permitted to have sex with, essentially. And and there was even talk that he eventually started to have homosexual sex with the men, some of the men. So yeah, it's kind of crazy that, uh, you know, he was just... Like I said, such a complicated guy. I mean, there was no rules, just whatever he wanted to do at the time. Yeah, One he, of did, the, he um... did. I was just going to say he did have sex with men. And there was one guy that was within the cult who was gay and wanted to come out as gay within the cult. And he told him, no, he said, uh, you're you can't do that. So he's told everyone that he was the only straight man. But then when a guy said, I want to come out as gay, he said, no, he said, you can go to town and go to a brothel anytime you want or to a, a, a club or a, a bar and get laid anytime you want, or I'll do it for you. I'll do you. Uh, <laughs> but you can't be gay on the, on the compound. Wow. Well, interestingly, there were nearly, I think a hundred babies born in the Guiana compound. It was not a small number of babies that were born there. So there were, you know, some 200 odd, some children that came on who were children of the people who came. And then there were a lot of babies who were born there. There were scores of infants who were um, poisoned during the massacre. So it's not as though people were not having sexual relations while they were there. Um, now are we, saying that maybe Jim Jones was the father of a great number of these babies, it would certainly fit with the cult leader, narcissistic cult leader aspect of it. But um, we do know that lots, you know, there's something that um, his wife was very proud of is the number of children that had been born in, in Guyana. And she, up until the point, it said up until the point where the last child was dead, she fought and had to be restrained. And you can hear in the depth De death tapes her screaming and hollering and him telling her mother, 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 calm down um, because she was very attached to the children and was fighting, you know, tooth and nail for them to live. And her son said that once the last child had died, she then went up and took the poison willingly because I imagine there was probably some resignation on her part at that point that, you know, no. nothing she could do. So, so, so I, to get to the the day, 
the story. We've talked about it a little bit. Um, Jones, like I, like he mentioned, he helped Harvey Milk um, become city supervisor. Harvey Milk, by the way, I'm pretty sure was a pedophile. So just FYI, he had he probably had dirt on Harvey Milk at that point. Um, but so in 19, so one of the things about Jim Jones was that a lot of cult leaders make the mistake of setting up doomsdays. So they'll have this certain day that's going to happen. And if you, you know, that's when we're going to die. That's when we're going to go to heaven. That's when whatever. The hail box people was, did that. Yep. Uh, heavens. I'd love to talk. Heaven's, heaven's gate. gate. Someday. Yeah. I would love to talk that like uh, Bo and peep. Oh my God. What a weird couple of people. Um, but what, what Jim Jones was good at, was he would give these doomsday scenarios and he'd say, if we do this, it won't happen or we'll get around it. So he found ways to have this idea that it was going to happen or this prophecy that was going to happen. But if they did this, it wouldn't. So he was able to skirt around doomsdays and people were like, if he, if he hadn't done this, if he hadn't told us, we would have gone through this thing. Mm -hmm, um, and mm -hmm. so uh, in 1974, uh, he talked to the Guyanese government and leased about 3,800 acres from them. And they started building the town. They started building the farms. They started putting the pigs in. Um, and then he stayed in San Francisco up until 1977. So they had um, people building that out for a good three years before he made the move. And he only made the move after Grace Stone left after he got worried about uh, the police coming after him. But the biggest thing was um, a news story coming out that described him as a cruel, paranoid criminal. And that was the day they moved to Guyana, to Jonestown, um, which they called religiously um, the promised land. And that was the script that he gave to all of his people to, to, when they talked back to home about how it was a promised land and how it was beautiful and it was wonderful. And that's how they spoke of it. So like Jessica kind of summarized in the beginning, um, great. Uh, one of the big people who I would say would be considered a hero outside of what happened with the suicide, alleged, not suicide, mass murder, um, was Greystone, who... Uh, started working and she was one of the concerned relatives in the group and she wanted to get her son, John, John out of Guyana because she was mm -hmm. worried for him. And so she and the concerned relatives um, finally went down. Uh, Leo Ryan, the, the um, congressman fought with, with uh, Jim Jones about coming in. Jim Jones said no several times. And then Jim Jones decided, Hey, Let's make it a show. Let's make everyone look good and happy. And they get there. Greystone stays home. And honestly, it was, uh, she says she's very thankful that she, she's not stayed home, stayed in the hotel um, mm -hmm. or in the embassy. And she says she's very thankful because she truly believes that if she had been the one who had come off of that bus or that plane with um, Leo Ryan, that the death festivities would have started immediately because because Jim was not going to be giving away that boy. Right. So like we said before, Leo Ryan gets there. They have news crews with them. Everyone's talking about how great it is. And then uh, for Jim, something tragic happens. One of the people who is done with being there and wants to leave slips one of the reporters a note saying he wants mm -hmm. to go. And so the reporter hand, hands the note to Jim Jones and lets him read it. And so this forces Jim's hand into playing the, oh yes, anyone, anyone can go at any time, um, which set off the events. So uh, Leo Ryan had brought one plane to bring people back with him so he could get people out. It turned out that at the after that started happening and people started saying they wanted to go, uh, they needed to have two planes. Um, so Jim Jones let them go. He let them go with Leo Ryan, Leo and the, the people who wanted to leave all go to the airstrip 
at the airstrip, one man in particular who was a very devoted follower of Jones, uh, his name was Larry Layton, uh, went with them. And Larry Layton, the, the, I, f- I forget what the, the several of the people who went, including the assistant to Leo Ryan, said, well, I don't trust him. I don't think he should come with us. I don't want to be in the same plane. I don't want to be in the same bus, truck. I don't want to do that. And they even had him frisked. They frisked him to make sure he didn't have a gun. And uh, they get to the airfield. They're all about to get in the plane. And up comes one of the tractors from Jonestown. And at that time, that's when the people from Jonestown who Jim had sent to kill Leo Ryan to stop these people from leaving, start the battle. And they start Mm -hmm. shooting. Uh, uh, What's his name? Uh, I forgot his name immediately. (laughs) Um, The guy who they didn't want to come along with them, Larry Layton. Larry uh, Layton. Had a gun hidden on him. They had frisked him, didn't find a gun. He pulled out the gun in the, the plane shot one guy two times, shot another girl two times, had one bullet left, pointed it in the face of the last woman in the plane, and it misfired. Mm-hmm. And so they fought for the gun. People died on the tarmac. And then that was when the death tape starts. That was when right. the the revolutionary su- suicide begins. That's when so- 300 children, 910 people, 600 ish quote unquote willingly started taking the flavor aid laced with cyanide. It's when Mr. Muggs was shot in the back of the head. When all was said and done, uh, Jim Jones, the savior and hero that he was saw all of these people die in pain and didn't have the guts to take the Kool-Aid himself. So he took out a gun and shot himself in the head. There were people with crossbows, uh, guards around the pavilion that held people in. They also had guns. Like I said, people were shot. People had uh, forced injections to die. But luckily, there were a few people, one being a little small contingent of people who he gave a suitcase full of cash to and said, take this to the Russian embassy, give this to the Russians, take out what you need to live for the rest of your life. But if you get caught, kill yourself. And so they took that. After, and the, the one, the guy who tells this story, uh, he said he took the the suitcase and he he ran off. And uh, the only reason he was able to do it was because he had just uh, not witnessed, but he witnessed the dead bodies of his infant son and his wife. And he was screaming, "You murdered my son! You murdered my son!" And he saw the only way out. Um, he ended up trying to go to the embassy, but then he dropped the suitcase and ran. Um, another lady got out into the thicket and she and her son walked for 30 miles in the jungle before they were found by, uh, Guyanese officials or police who took them to safety. Yeah. That's Um, what people don't realize that this compound was surrounded by hundreds of miles of jungle. And the airstrip that people were coming in on from the planes was five miles away from the compound. So they were in such a state of isolation that it's um, very hard for us to comprehend that you could walk around in in nothing but jungle for 33 miles before somebody will find you. And um, just to note, um, you mentioned being two people was actually one person, a guy named Vernon Gosney. Um, Vernon Gosney was the man who slipped the note to the reporter, and he was also the man who said, Larry Layton is not a defector. I don't want to get in the plane with this guy. I don't want him. And he was also shot. Yeah. So um, that's kind of a lot of this story kind of converges around Gosney. And Gosney is one of the very few people who actually made it out of this alive. But unfortunately, his uh, his son did not. Yeah. Well, he wasn't the, so yeah. that his son. I don't. I. I don't know. About no, it's son, not that. Not the guy who was screaming about uh, his baby, yeah. but his uh, Gosney's four-year-old son was in the compound, and the, and Jim Jones made him sign a document saying that I'm leaving my son with you willingly. And in Gosney's mind, this was a better option because um, he believed on some level what 
Jones had been telling him about them setting up concentration camps for black people in the United States and that things had like deteriorated into this uh, race war. So he, because his uh, son was mixed race, he thought it was better to leave him in Jonestown. He had no idea that they would go to the level that night that they did. But um, Gosney was shot and ran. He was shot on the tarmac and ran into the jungle and was able to um, survive miraculously despite having been shot, gut shot nonetheless. Um, yeah. Passed out in the jungle, woke up several hours later, made his way back to the tarmac, um, survived and became a cop in Hawaii. <laughs> as yeah. far wow. as I know, he's still he's still a police officer in Hawaii. So, you know, um, one thing I thought also was peculiar. At first, they released four hundred and eight victims. You know, and that mm -hmm. went to like worldwide. And then a few days later, you know, they had to walk it back, and it it had doubled, more than doubled, yeah. and their their excuse was well there were small women and children underneath some of the bodies but um this guy named joel holsinger he was like the aide to congressman ryan uh i couldn't think of his name earlier but he's the, one of the guys who was really pushing that the cia had a role in it and um he even says he's on tape saying that uh, he believes he said at first they actually said that a bunch of people, several hundred people made it into the jungles. Mm -hmm. And that was a thing too. And he thinks that those people were pulled out of the jungles, shot and dragged back. And right. he, he said that the, uh, the medical examiner, I guess, kind of uh, believed the same thing from the mm -hmm. way the bodies were laid out. And supposedly there were tracks where the bodies had been dragged and stuff like that. Yeah. They do say 300, around 300 people, either died from the forced injection or by gunshots. Mm -hmm. So that, that makes sense. And there is the story of that woman. I think her name is Hacanth. I'm trying to find her on the, uh, the list. Hacanth Thrasher. And she was 76. Yeah, she's a 76 year old woman. And um, when Jones called everyone to the pavilion, some instinct in this little old lady was like, uh, uh, I'm not going down there. There's no way in hell. And she wedged herself underneath her bed and was able to survive the night um, hidden beneath her bunk. And in the morning, she tells the story of coming out and seeing all of the bodies laid out everywhere. And just, uh, man, God loves you. You know, if you you got that kind of instinct, you know. And um, one, one story that I had heard as a kid um, is about the helicopter pilot who is coming into Jonestown on the 19th, the, the Sunday, the 19th after, and him saying um, on the recording, there's colored paper all over the ground. And the what he thought was brightly colored pieces of paper was actually like the shirts and the clothing of all of the people laid all over the grounds. And he, at first he could not process that these were human bodies because why would so many human bodies be laying all over the place like this? He thought it was like some kind of confetti or something. And it reminded me a lot of my experience watching the second plane hit during 9-11. It took me a while to process that someone had done this on purpose. I thought, how could two horrible accidents happen in a row like this? He, didn't he see the other the, didn't he see the smoking building? How could he have accidentally hit the building? It, it, it wouldn't fit in my brain that someone had done this on purpose. And so I think the helicopter pilot was probably experiencing a similar thing. Like, what's all this paper? Because you wouldn't process that it was humans laid all over the ground like that. Uh, one note that I wanted to mention was um, Stefan and Jim Jones Jr., two of his sons were in, in George, Georgetown for a basketball tournament. Basketball tournament, so, yeah. And so they were not in Jonestown that day. And that day, right as things were going on, uh, there was they were with a woman. I can't, I don't know what her name was, but she was a very Sharon. devoted follower. Sharon yes. was a very devoted follower yes. of Jim Jones. And um, this is heartbreaking. But uh, she, J Jim was on the radio and he wanted to talk to 
his sons and he gave them a um a coded message which was to kill anyone in sight and then mm-hmm. to kill yourselves and the sharon woman heard it and these two boys said no we're not going to do that right and they said where's sharon and so sharon her two daughters and a another man had gone into a bathroom and locked the door and that's where she they had committed suicide and they killed their two little girls separately from the Jonestown okay. situation in I believe it was the embassy in Georgetown. Yeah, they had a house which was like a way station for people who were coming in, going out, you know, because pretty much Georgetown is like the biggest town. It's the it's the capital, but it's also the biggest town there. And so um one of uh Sharon's daughters was actually 21 years old. Um, not a little girl. And it said well, there were that her little girls out there. They, they, um, she had a little girl and a little boy. This is uh, okay. according to the documentary that I watched. She had a little girl and a little boy and then her 21-year-old daughter, Sharon, or Sharon's 21-year-old daughter from a previous marriage. That The father of that 21-year-old girl had come with the senator or the congressman's party as one of the concerned relatives. And he was staying in Georgetown because that's where his daughter was. And he had dinner with them that night and had plans to meet up with his daughter the next morning. And um, little did he know that all the time that this din- dinner was occurring, they were getting orders from Jim Jones that they had to kill themselves. And um, his 19 year old son, Stefan, who uh, was part of the basketball team, had overheard this order and said that the 21 year old daughter very calmly accepted okay, we have to kill ourselves. She's very, very calm about this. These people were zealots. They were true believers. And very calmly, this 21-year-old girl accepted this. And it said that when he went into that upper bedroom that Cam is talking about, that Sharon and her daughter had um, killed each other, Um, that they had killed each other by slitting each other's throats after killing the two small children, which was a boy and a girl. So yes, she had two daughters, but her smaller children were a boy and a girl. And then her and her 21-year-old daughter then killed themselves. Um, Stefan and the, and the other uh, son did not <laughs> follow their fa- father's directions to kill themselves and survive to this day. Um, but an interesting thing I found about um, Larry Layton, who was the shooter on the plane, he got 18 years for his role in the whole Jonestown massacre and was released in t- 2002. So he, yeah. as far as I know, Larry Layton is alive and served out his sentence and then was released. So you may be at a quick trip tomorrow and be standing in line behind Larry Layton and you would not know it. So this and is no all was ever... very much part of our culture still. And these people still are walking around. Um, the 87 people who actually got out. One in uh, no one at all was ever held to account for what happened that day. No, nope. never, not a single person. Aside, aside from Larry going to jail for eighteen years, I mean, he did. Yeah, but that, but that wasn't that. Time. It was just for the shooting on the tarmac. Yeah. Yes. Um, but that's the story. Um, I know that I think um, maybe the last thing to really cover about it is. Uh, what effect that had and how it's affected our own history and our nowadays situation. So, uh, odd man, how, I mean, we talked about how they used um, the Jonestown massacre as a means to justify burning Waco. We, uh, that was very clear. They, they said it. That's, and I think that was part of it was, Federal government wasn't able to stop Wake, uh, Jonestown, so they wanted Waco as a consolation to show that they can take out the bad actor cult leaders. That mm-hmm. was part. Uh, but how do you think it has affected us now? What ripples are we still feeling? Great question, man. I, I think that well, every cult since then is equated to Jonestown. You know, it's the the one that we all think about when we think about cults, I think. And yeah. of course we get the term drinking the Kool-Aid, 
even though it wasn't Kool-Aid, it was <laughs> flavor aid, right? Right. And, and that's a term you hear all the time, especially when you're talking about politics. But I think that there is something about it that just, it's a psychological thing that um, triggers fear, confusion, just all kinds of different emotions when you think about it and the way it went down. And, you know, that one picture, I always think about the picture. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it, but it's Jim Jones's chair. It's outside under one of the, the, the roofed, you know, buildings. And it's a big wooden chair sitting by itself. And behind it is a huge sign. And it says those that don't know the past are doomed to repeat it. Yeah. And then and I've seen it without the dead bodies. And then I've seen it where the dead bodies are lying in front of the chair after they all died. And, and I've never seen a more eerie, disturbing picture in my life. Oh, I think yeah. that, uh, you know, we all, it's one of those things that we can't really fathom it, you know, possibly even if we had all of the facts, maybe it would still be hard for us to understand it. And, uh, because we weren't there and we weren't there for all the times that those people spent with Jim and, and, we weren't subjected to all the hours upon hours of propaganda and psychological manipulation that, that he subjected those poor people to. So uh, it, it's amazing. It really is. I, and I thank you guys for asking me to check into it because I only knew the uh, kind of the regular pop culture idea of it. So very disturbing. I don't very know what to say. <laughs> what can you say? Really? <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's like we haven't even just to know we haven't even really scratched the surface of everything. This is this whole thing, despite it being an hour and 40 minutes in, is just a very baseline uh, description of what occurred. And like we hit the major points. But as Cam was saying, there's so many layers to why this occurred the way that it did and the aftermath in our culture that we could do. Eight, eight more episodes just going, you know, how this affected Waco, how this affected, you know, um, all, all of the very various uh, aspects of our culture that play into it now. And so that's something to note is we don't understand it. Not really. Um, let me ask, uh, I'll ask our final fun questions um, in a minute. But uh, what do you think odd man is the most important lesson to come out of Jonestown. What do you think is something that what, not necessarily the silver lining, but if you have a silver lining, what do you think that is? Well, that the people who made it out, made it out. I think that's pretty awesome. And to live, to tell that tale and to also be able to, you know, I've seen a lot of their interviews and the, the way, you know, they they warn people, not to fall for these sort of things. And um, yeah, so I think that the lesson we can learn from being so trust trustful of somebody like that is probably the two <coughs> best you. things that come out of that. Yeah. I think that's an <laughs> well, important point there. You know, it, it, as, as tragic as everything was, there were people who made it out, you know, and there are stories of great heroism and great bravery that took place in this and, you know, like the story of Christine Miller, who I didn't know before today, but listening to that woman stand her ground, despite the circumstances around her, really, I, I, I admire her a great deal. And I think that there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of things to talk about as far as lessons learned, because people think of this as some extreme situation that people were crazy or extremely stupid or whatever to be in Jonestown at all. Mm -hmm. But if you look at any number of things that are happening right now in our lives, you see how easily people follow instructions, comply, take the so-called Kool-Aid, drink the mm -hmm. Kool-Aid, because there are a lot of people right now who are drinking Kool-Aid and they don't know what's in it. And so it is good, I think, for those who are discerning, who can think um, to see 
that maybe we need to think about maybe these people aren't as stupid as we think they are. Maybe the propaganda was just that good. Maybe the propaganda mm -hmm. we're living through right now, even though we see every hole, we see every stupid, desperate move is better than we think it is. And to know that each and every one of us is not immune to propaganda. We're all um, able to be drawn in by it and by being told the things that we want to hear. Propaganda doesn't come with a flashing sign that says, hey, I'm propaganda. Hey, I'm fake news. It comes as exactly what you want to hear in that moment. What is comforting? What gives you a sense of control in an uncontrollable world? And so if someone is, you know, telling you all the things you want to hear, that's your flashing sign. And that is the hardest thing to push away from is what you want to be true and what you want to hear. So I think, you know, if I had anything to give anyone as a takeaway from this is to, you know, just know that you're not different than any of the people that met their end at Jonestown. You think you are. You think you'd be better than that. You think you'd be smarter than that, but you're not. None of us are. This this could happen to anyone. Given the right circumstances. For Given sure. the right circumstances, yes. So that was a depressing story. Yes. Um, I appreciate you coming on, Odd Man. I want to do another episode with you on something else, and I think maybe next time I will not choose something that I happen to have read books about so that you can read. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 man. I had a great time. You, you taught me things that I didn't know, so I think that's great. Um, well, our big question at the end of episodes, uh, we are a <laughs> podcast like how. How are you going to answer this? I was very curious how you would answer this question after such a depressing topic. <laughs> uh, but yeah, our show, it, it's we believe in hope. We believe in, as Malice and others call it, the white pill. As and Christine so, Miller said, as long as you're alive, there's hope. That's what that woman said moments before, before her death. And it struck me because that's the theme of our show. <laughs> Um, but what is something it can be global, it can be national, it can be local, it can be personal, any level. What is something that you believe is uh, a white pill or something that is good that motivates you to carry on that we can share with our audience so that they can see just a, another little, little glimmer of light in this dark world? Wow, that's a heavy question. Um, because I, you know, how it is, you, you get. You look into so many dark things, even regular politics now is just, everything's so negative. And uh, you kind of sometimes you feel like, is there any hope? But obviously there always is hope. And I think that it's as cheesy as it might sound, a community like you guys and me, we're talking. This is awesome. We, we, we can have adult conversations, teach each other, one another things that we didn't know we're, we're willing to learn from one another. I'm sure there's things that we disagree on here and there, but this, this community of you know, podcasters and researchers, I, I feel like it's given me some hope and um, you know, to just that there's other people out there that are curious and want to kind of help others learn things and want to learn themselves. Yeah. And, and we don't think we have all the answers and we're actually curious about life and, and we're looking for the answers. So that gives me hope that people, not everyone is brainwashed. Not everyone has drank the Kool-Aid. And so right. I have to remind myself that, of that a lot because, you know, if you go out in regular society, there are a lot of people that are just kind of like following the herd. But as we know, there's tons of people that aren't. Yep. Yeah, that's great. I think that's great. Well, that gives I, me like hope said, too. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, I appreciate you coming on. I'm sorry that I talked so much. I feel like no, man. I, I feel I feel like I talked way too much. But no, no. I appreciate you coming on. I do want to delve deeply into some of the other things, other cults or other things that uh, you research because it's it's all fascinating to me. I, I this n next month, October is going to be this kind of super spooky month that I'm really excited about. Uh, but maybe we can we I, I'd love to look into some other topics with you. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, and with oh, that, unless real you quick, something. tell it, tell us uh, the name of your podcast and where to find you. Oh yeah. So it's 
the oddcast ft the odd man out and uh you know just check me out on twitter or instagram underscore the odd man out look in the profile it's got all my links to all my platforms excellent awesome. we'll put your information in our description so thank, thank anybody who much. wants to find him go check out his awesome podcast yeah thank you <laughs> uh so like i said thank you i will i'll let you go so that we can ramble off all of our stuff um cool. but again thank you let's do it again i absolutely i enjoyed, I enjoyed this thank you i uh, do thank you guys thank you so with that dear audience uh, I need to tell you all the things that are coming up. Um, we have, we, I almost have the full October schedule listed for you next week. You'll see all that I, all that we have planned. Uh, but coming up next week, we are going to be visited again by our good British, lovely British friend, Kate Cheryl to talk about Gothic Yay. spiritualism. Uh, going to be fun for that. My favorite true crime podcaster from, um, dark topic. Jack Luna will be joining us. I don't know exactly how, what we're going to talk about. Maybe why he likes talking about murder, his past. He has a lot of crazy <laughs> stories, um, but it's going to be interesting, at least to me. And as long as I'm interested, I mean. Someone someone recently asked me why white suburban women are so interested in murder. And I was like, I think it's because we think we can solve crime or like figure <laughs> out crimes. But to be fair, uh, the Gabby Potato ca case was cracked by people on the internet so score one for suburban white women well that and luca magnata as well oh but, okay I, I didn't know about that <laughs> but okay yeah did, if you, there's a documentary on netflix called don't f with cats and oh, it's all yeah. about the uncovering of luca magnata and his murder of that guy uh the, after that the reddit go ahead yeah no i was gonna say after that uh we're going to going to be joined by cody cook and uh, a special guest host, Ryan Burgett, to talk about our long-awaited interdimensional beings talk. Um, We've been which, planning this for a long time, you guys. Time. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, we have Ryan coming on, who's been reading a lot about it. I've been reading a lot about it. And Cody actually wrote a book about it. So we're gonna have we're gonna have a good time kind of fleshing that out, and then uh, right after that, we we're gonna have on the occult rejects, a couple of guys who were rejected by uh, satanic secret societies. So we're going to talk about that as well. October is going to be really cool. Um, past that, uh, like I said, please like and subscribe here or on your favorite podcatcher. Uh, leave us ratings on podcatchers. Do anything you can to help us keep going. Uh, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash the mad ones. Check that out. Um, I'm, I haven't built that up too much yet. We're just getting started on offering exclusive stuff there. I may be shifting some stuff around. Um, so check us out there. If you want to see Kate's episode next week, several hours earlier than anyone else, join Rockfin. It will be their premium behind the old paywall. And so you can sit and watch and chat with us as we do that that day. Um, Let's see what else. If you want to find me on Twitter at Cam Harless, if you want to find uh, Jessica at Soup Canarchist, if you want a shirt, I think I do a good job making shirts. We are the mad ones.com slash store. Like I mentioned, we're on all podcatchers, um, youtube.com slash the mad ones. We're on Odyssey. I think no, that's not it. Just a reminder get your coffee, rymcoffee.com, promo code the mad ones, righteousfelon.com, promo code mad ones for some really great beef jerky try the turkey no, jerky it's really good the foul capone as it were the foul capone, uh, so yeah. with that we thank you for sticking around we thank you for listening hopefully you learned something uh, i know i learned some stuff i didn't know i think everyone left with a little information they didn't have before so uh with that my dear friends go do something good for someone be a helper <laughs>